for him. We're talking about gospel conversations today, and uh, a gospel conversation with this young man uh, named Gary is how it all began for me. Every evening I would go over to the USO. I had a real nice place to stay. We called it a hooch back in those days. It's kind of out in the edge of the jungle uh, near, the, near the fence where they kill the weeds with Agent Orange, regardless of what they said. But uh, never, we were out there, and, uh, and there was a lot of misbehavior going on in the airman's barracks. And so they wanted to, to get you know, a little more weight in there. So they, I was an NCO at the time, and they asked me to come in there and, and live in, in the airman's barracks and, and kind of see if we could reduce a little bit of the drug trade <laughs> that, was, that was going on. And it was right next door to the USO. So I'd uh, come in, I'd work midnights, and I would uh, get up and go to, go to eat, and then I'd come back and go to the USO and, and write a letter at home. And uh, I'm sitting there at my table, minding my own business, and there was another table in front of me, and there was a fellow sitting there, and he had some books and papers. And every time I looked up and, and made eye contact with him, he was looking at me. And after a few minutes, I thought, now what's this guy looking for? What, what's going on here? I'm going to have to go over there and meet him or punch him or something, you know, <laughs> and uh, because he was just staring at me all the time. <coughs> and so I got up to go get a cup of coffee. And when I came back by, I said, what are you reading? And as soon as I said it, I thought, I asked for this. <laughs> He's reading the Bible. Oh, boy. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm reading the Bible. And this, uh, right out of the gate, he said, are you a Christian? And I lied. My dad was a Methodist preacher, so I kind of glommed on to that. And I said, yeah, my dad's a preacher. I knew I wasn't saved. I didn't know why I lied about it. I guess I was ashamed of the fact that I, I knew I should be saved, but I wasn't. And so I told him yes, and we talked for a minute, and then I excused myself. Next night, I came back in there, and there he sat. And I was under such incredible conviction of embarrassment that I was not willing to own the fact that I had walked away from everything I was taught when I was a child. And so I went up and I said, can I talk to you for a minute? And he said, sure. So I sat down and I said, I told you a lie yesterday. And he looked at me like, really? And I said, you asked me if I was a Christian. The truth is, no, I'm not. And I don't want to be. But I didn't want to get into it with you. And so I just told you something to kind of put an end to it. And he was so sweet about it. He said, well, okay. Like that. Wasn't judgmental. Wasn't aggressive was just friendly. He said, sit down. Where are you from? And, I, and of course, we were at the same base there in Thailand, and we had come over from the same base in the States. And uh, he, he, had, he worked days, and I worked nights, and we'd kind of meet in the middle there. And so Gary began to talk to me and witness to me. And it was really easy to talk to him. He was such a good conversationalist, such an interesting fellow. And I said, well, what about you? You've been overseas before? And he said, no, it's my first deployment. He said, I was kind of sad I had to come. Why is that? He said, well, my wife had a baby three weeks after I left. I said, they wouldn't let you stay? He said, nope, I tried. Isn't that something? The guy didn't get to meet his own child until he got home months later. But we, came, we became friends. And he asked me one time if I would go with, the, with him to the chapel. And I thought, oh, I don't want to do this. But I said, yeah, why not? And so we met and we went to the chapel. And the fellow that got up there, oh, my. He, he, didn't, he didn't have a clue what the gospel was. He didn't understand the Bible. He had religion. Uh, but he was a smoker and a drinker and a cusser, and we all knew it. And so while he was holding forth, I looked over at my new friend Gary. And I said, Gary... Is this what you're talking about? Because honestly, no, 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 no disrespect meant to my father. Uh, he, he was a United Methodist, and I grew up in, in that system. And if you're a United Methodist, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, nevertheless, I asked my friend Gary, new friend Gary, I said, is this what you're talking about? Is this what you've been telling me about? And he kind of paused and looked down and said, no, John, I think, I think this man 
probably means what I'm talking about. That made more sense to me than anything I'd ever heard. Because I kind of thought that too. But I thought, I don't have the right to judge anybody if they say they're a Christian. Well, I've got to leave that with them. But I thought, if people claim to be a Christian and have no more testimony for the truth than that chaplain had, what do we do with that? Are we supposed to say, okay, everybody who claims to be a Christian must be one, and if we really want to know what a Christian is, we sort of take all of them together, mix them all up in one big pot, and then take the common denominators out. You know, what are the things they all have in common? And that must be what it is. I had a godly grandmother, prayed for me every day of my life until uh, she went to heaven. And uh, I, I never doubted that she was a Christian. Uh, but then I had some other relatives that they, they were good, decent people, you know, farmers and workers. And my other granddad was a, a railroad engineer. Uh, he went to a church that, that was kind of flaky, <laughs> okay? But um, at any rate, uh, when, when I heard Gary say that, it just awoke something in my mind that there might be some people who think they're Christians that really aren't. And that got my curiosity. And I thought, well, how can that be that a person could claim to be a Christian and not actually be one? So I became very, very interested and concerned to find out what a real Christian really is. And what makes a person a Christian? Is it just that they say they are? Is it that they go to church? That they listen to preaching? That they pray sometimes? What makes a person a Christian? And as I began to talk to Gary, and he began to witness to me, and just love on me, and show me the love of God, we, we met that chaplain, and he made that statement to me. I, it just made me think in a way I had never thought before about what the gospel must be. Well, I had this godly grandmother, and one of the things she did when my brother and I would go spend time with her in the summers is uh, she would read the Bible to us, and she would tell us all about uh, Jesus is coming back, and, you know, there's going to be a thing we call the rapture, and when the rapture comes, then we're, uh, all the believers are going to be taken. Well, I was scared to death of this thing called the rapture. I remember one time when I was a young, a young, I maybe 12, I don't know, something like that. And um, I was home. We lived out in the country. And, and um, it was not a school day. Maybe it was in the summer. Maybe it was a weekend. I don't know. But I know we were all home. And my sister, my little sister, she's a little, little kid at the time. And... Um, my brother was somewhere with my dad, and it was just me. And uh, I must have been 13 or 14, I think, because I was in high school. But uh, all of a sudden, Mom was gone somewhere. I couldn't find her anywhere. And I ran all through the house trying to find her. And I thought, oh, no. The rapture came. And I missed it. <laughs> I mean, that's what I thought, because I, my grandmother had been telling me about it. You better get ready for it. And I wasn't, and I knew it. And now I missed it. And I thought, now what? I thought for a few minutes, well, got the whole house to myself. But then, <laughs> but then, I, thought, then I thought, no, 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 no. If this, if this is the rapture and she's gone, I'm in trouble. You know, I'm going to run out of groceries here before long. And what am I going to do? And I started thinking very selfishly about the whole thing. But I do remember running all over the house. And then I thought, maybe she's over at the neighbor's. And so I ran over to the neighbors, and there she was. And, and I, I wasn't real spiritual about the whole thing. I mean, I, I spoke to her in a way I'd never, ever spoken to her before. And she was coming home, and I said, where have you been? <laughs> like that. And she looked at me as if, watch your tone, young man. <laughs> and uh, so I've been over to the neighbors. And, uh, and I, I remember how it scared me at the time. And because the reason it did is because I thought, well, if this is true and if this is going to happen, that's important. And if the Lord is coming and he's going to get people, you know, what, what do I need to do? So I would have these little times of conviction and, and concern 
And when I was under conviction and feel guilty about my sinful life and things like that, I tried to straighten up a little bit. Now, don't tell me that you didn't do some of that too before you got saved. Because I thought, if this is true, if, God, if, the, if there really is a God and we're going to answer to him, what am I going to say? What have I got to recommend me to him? And I, you've heard it. I mean, I've talked to people and they, well, I hope so. And, well, I'll do the best I can. And things like, well, I'm not as good as I ought to be, but, you know, I'm not as, not as bad as some people. And You know, you've heard all of that, right? And so now... These fellows over in Thailand, where we were at the time, they, were start, they started witnessing to me. And I started realizing, you know, this probably is real. And I, I, need, to, I need to get serious at this time and, and mean it. Clean myself up. That's what I need. And then when I talked to Gary and he told me, no, this, this chapel needs what I'm talking about. So for about a month, I, uh, I took stock of my life thought about my selfishness, thought about my carelessness, thought about my sinful behavior, and all the things that I was doing that were contrary to what I knew I was supposed to do. And I, I didn't make any rash vows or any rash promises to God, but I started trying to moderate my sin a little bit. I had some sinful habits, and I thought, you know, this would be a good time to give those up. Good time to straighten up, do a few things. And I, I did go to chapel two or three times. And that's when I heard that, that fellow. There was another, another fellow there. He was actually from the Assemblies of God. But he knew Jesus. And he would give invitations. And when he was finished preaching, here's how he gave his invitation. And it was all of us, all men, you know, there at this base. Men. If you want Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, stand to your feet. <laughs> I thought, good night, this is serious. I mean, you know, and it, I tell you, if you didn't mean it, you didn't stand up. Well, I didn't stand up <laughs> because I didn't want to be embarrassed. I didn't want to lie about it. But I was in that kind of an environment. And so uh, one night, there was another fellow, he said, you want to come down to the mission house with us on Friday? I thought, what in the world's a mission house? And it, sure enough, it was where a missionary couple from the States lived. It was their house. And they had opened their home up to GIs who at the nearby base. And on Friday nights, they, we, some guys would go down there, and they would prepare a home-cooked meal and then have a little Bible study prayer time. So when I heard the words home-cooked meal, <laughs> I decided, I think I'll go. <laughs> And so sure enough, we went down there. And it was a wonderful experience, wonderful meal. We got all finished, and we all pulled some chairs around over in the living room, got around in a circle. <clears throat> and the missionary taught us the Bible lesson from 1 Corinthians 9. I still remember the text. And I was under some real conviction. And when we got finished with the Bible study, everybody got out of their chair and knelt down. And they were all kneeling in a circle. There's about seven or eight of us or so. And we're all in a circle, and they're praying. We didn't have to be a genius to figure out. If they keep going around this circle, they're going to get to me here in a few minutes. And what am I going to say? I mean, I, I thought, well, I could just pass, you know. <laughs> but I thought, I can't do that. I mean, I'm here with these guys, and they're praying. And I, I've heard a lot of prayer in my life. And I thought, I could I, surely I could come up with something. And I spent most of the prayer time trying to plan how I was going to respond when it was my turn. You ever been in a situation like that? I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. You know, every prayer I'd prayed up to them was, was a lie, you know, that I, that I made up for my grandmother or somebody. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me. These guys are talking to God, and they know him, and he knows them. And God is real, and he knows me even though I don't really know him. The guys that were witnessing to me, they would quote me a verse and I'd tell them where it was because I'd been in church so much. And the next thing you know, the guy next to me said amen. And now they're waiting on me. And I thought, well, if I'm going to pray, 
I ought to tell the truth. And I don't remember the exact words I said. But here's what I simply put before the Lord. Lord, I believe you're real. I've known about you most of my life. But I've never really gotten to know you. And I know you know me. And I'm ashamed of an awful lot of what you know. It was words to that effect. But I said, Lord, I want to say tonight, everything that you're offering me, I take it in Jesus' name. And everything I am, I give to you. That was my sinner's prayer. Now, later on, when I learned there was a sinner's prayer, I thought, well, maybe I didn't do that right. <laughs> but that was my sinner's prayer. Lord, I want what you're offering, and I give you what I've got, which is basically nothing. And I got up from that prayer like a blind man who'd been given his sight. Went back on the bus, got on the bus, and went back to the barracks, went to bed that night, laid there thinking, this is new. This is something new. I've never known this experience in my life. Lord, you're listening to me right now. As I, I'm laying here in the bed trying to go to sleep, but I'd just soon talk to you for a little while. Finally, I fell asleep, and I woke up the next morning, and the first thought that came into my mind was, I'm a born-again person. I'm a Christian. I've never been a Christian. I've called myself a Christian. If church would do it, well, I should have it. But church isn't what it's all about. It's all about knowing Jesus. And I just laid there in the bed, praising him and thanking him that he had saved my soul. Couldn't wait to write a big, long letter home and tell my wife what had happened to me. Had some habits I needed to get rid of. I had one, one habit that included something I used to carry around in my pocket. And so I thought, well, I can't do that anymore because I, I don't want my new Christian friends to see me doing that. But I didn't quit right quick. I mean, I, I thought, well, I'll use up what I got. Don't want to be a bad steward, <laughs> you know. And so I can't give them to anybody else because I can't corrupt somebody else. So I'd go hide. Now, I just thought, this is humiliating to tell you this, but I went in the latrine and closed the door, and I, and I practiced my smoking habit in there for a little while. I did that for three days, and I thought, nobody said a word to me about this except the Lord Jesus who says, give that up. And I said, yes, Lord. And that was it. And God delivered me, delivered me, never turned back. I couldn't imagine that the Lord would, would, would do that for me in that way. And I found that he was helping me. He was answering my prayers. He was showing me things from the Bible that although I knew the story and he even knew the text, I didn't know the meaning. And it was as though the Lord himself, from the words of Scripture, was having a conversation with me personally about about what he wanted me to know. And so I started having gospel conversations with people. So on, the, on a job one night, I was in charge of the midnight shift, driving a dispatch truck, taking the, the guys. I was, a, I was a crew chief on fighter jets. And uh, so we're out on a flight line, and, and I'm taking the guys around to the diff different jobs. The guy comes up, hey, Sergeant, he asked me, you got, you got any? And I said, no, I don't have any. And he said, why? I said, because I, I quit that. And he said, why? <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> I got saved. And he said, you got what? <laughs> and God put me in a situation I didn't have a clue how to witness. I didn't have an idea about how to share Christ with others. So the Lord just did it for me. He sent people up to ask me what was going on. What happened to you? How did this come about? And so one night I started giving him my testimony. And by that time it, was, it had been about two weeks. And I pretty well figured out what I needed to tell people that happened to me. So I was giving my testimony and I got all finished with it. The guy who had come up to me 
to ask me if I would help him sin. And, and I got all finished, and, and, I, and he said, can I do that? And I said, well, yeah. Just do what I did. Just talk to him. Tell him you want what he's offering you, and you'll give him whatever you've got. And he bowed his head and prayed on the spot. And like me, he finished up his hitch. He got out and went into the ministry. I got a letter from him over 40 years later. He sent me a book that he had borrowed from me. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and he found it was under conviction. What a, what a story. What a, what a thing for, for God to work in those ways. And so I started sharing my story, and guys started getting saved as a result of me having a conversation with them about what happened to me. And I began to realize why God put me on this earth. And I told Gary, I said, Gary, I believe God wants me in the ministry. I believe he wants me to preach. And he asked me so sweetly and so sincerely, how do you know? And I said, well, I don't know exactly how to explain it. I mean, it's, I didn't see any visions or, or anything like that. But I guess I could just, there's only two things I could tell you as to why I believe God wants in the ministry. Uh, number one, I want to do it. And number two, I think I can. <laughs> there it was. That was my call to preach. You see, that's not enough. Well, don't, 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 don't try to convince me because I've been doing it for nearly 50 years now. <laughs> but my point is I wanted to and I knew how. And God changed my life. And I realized there from the very beginning that if I just have conversations with people about the Lord, that the well, same thing might happen to me because it all started in a gospel conversation when the fella uh, just started a conversation with me. And, and we became friends. And it influenced me. And then they end up getting me down to that missionary's house. And the gospel became so clear. And I put my faith in the Lord. And I was a blind man who now could see. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then over the years, I went to some soul winning conferences. And I went to go hear the big name preachers who built the big name churches. And they taught their techniques. And I read a bunch of books about it. And I memorized the procedures. And, and, uh, so, and then I started using the techniques. And, and, uh, and, and, and the, the one that most all of us have been practicing for years, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I would go up to people and just boldly stand right there and say, let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? You know, very rarely, I mean, this is my testimony now, very rarely did I ever get a favorable, honest answer to that question. Never, very Hardly ever did anybody say, well, no, I don't know that. But would you tell me about it? I didn't get that kind of response very often. Sometimes I did, and I saw several people saved like that. But I've seen more people come to Christ by just having a simple conversation with them about it and showing enough interest in them to find out what kind of things they would like to talk about. And I begun, uh, began to realize that God was not using me to save an eternal soul. He was doing the saving. He wanted me to be a witness for him. He wanted me to bring others into the conversation. So let me ask you a question. Does anybody, any, you men, I, I think men are us, the usual culprits here, but any of you men like sports? You like to watch football or anything like that? You like football? All right, thank you for your honesty. All right? Now, let's say, let's say you go to the barbershop, okay? And you're at the barbershop, and you're sitting there, and there's other fellows sitting around, and there's been a game that you want to talk about. You know? I mean, you saw a play that was just some of those fellows. I mean, they, they defy gravity. You know, there's, uh, it's amazing to, to see what those people are, are able to do with their bodies and the, the punishment they take in the process while they're collecting their millions of dollars. But, uh, you know, I'm not jealous. <laughs> okay. But uh, you're sitting there, and you're thinking, Boy, I'd like to talk about that game. Whew, what a game. What a game. That play. Mm. How am I going to get this conversation onto football? How am I going to, how am I going to steer this? I want, the, I want to talk to the barber and some other guys sitting around here. What can I do? How about this? Hey, fellas, listen. If there was a game tonight, do you know for sure you'd go? 
Is that what you're going to do? No. No. You're just going to jump in there and interrupt somebody else and say, did you see that game? You know, and you're going to be excited about it, and you're going to talk about it. Why? Because you care about it. You, because you want to talk about it. Right? And if you want to talk about it, you'll have a conversation about it. And you'll be able to talk to some others. And it's amazing how Christians tie themselves in knots present, trying to present the gospel to people. Well, if you know and love Jesus, just talk about it. Amen. I've met a whole lot of people in the years that Carol and I have been married, and I have never waited for an invitation to talk about her. You know? In fact, give me an opportunity and I'll talk to you about her. The Lord brought her into my life in a, in a marvelous and miraculous way. And it, it is amazing. You should hear the story. <laughs> I'd be happy to talk to you about it. <laughs> and be happy to tell you about how I met Jesus, too. And what am I doing this morning? Look, I could stand up here and give you an exposition of a passage of Scripture that you might find fascinating. You might say, man, I never knew that was in there. You know, preachers like to do that. We like to put out a banquet for folks. We like to make our finest dish and put it all out there and let them enjoy it. But this morning, I'm just talking to you about Jesus. And there's a place for that too. Normally, normally, I don't do this in the pulpit. I've been to school. I know how to make up a sermon and things like that. But I want to take a few, I am taking a few minutes this morning just to show you that if it's a subject that you love about a person that you love and you know that person loves you, if I may use my love for Carol as an illustration, you can't shut up about it. <laughs> you know? You have to talk about it. Now, I have found a way during this sermon to talk about my grandchildren and a couple of them. And my wife, we like to talk about the things we love, don't we? And if you're having trouble being a witness for Jesus, don't, don't go learn some technique that in your carelessness you will try to present to others so you won't have to feel guilty for not being his, being his missionary. Just fall in love with him and fall in love with the truth. Fall in love with the Bible. Fall in love with the passage of Scripture. T tell them what happened to you. Share your testimony. How would you get saved? I mean, if you can't tell somebody how you get saved, you better check up on yourself. All right? I mean, if you know how the Lord worked in your life and you're telling others, I'm just chatting with you here. And I'm doing this on purpose because I want you to see that having conversations about the gospel is a simple thing. I'm going to tell you two illustrations and then we'll be finished. And both of these stories are recorded in this little book. The first one was a young man. I had all the social advantage in this situation. I'm older. I'm more experienced. I know the truth. He's young and inexperienced. He's polite, and his parents have raised him well. We are sitting beside each other on an airplane. I'm, I'm, I really, I guess if somebody said, well, what do you do? I'm, a, I'm an airplane evangelist. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you're sitting right there. And uh, your uh, conversation, like this young man, he had, he had finished high school a couple of years before, and he was on his way to Washington D.C. to to uh, uh, enroll in the Job Corps. You know about the Job Corps? And they were going to bring him up there and put him in a in a like a dormitory, send him through some classes, and he was going to stay there for a while. And when he finished, he would come out as a certified electrician, make a pretty good living. And he was interested in that and he wanted to do it, so he's sitting next to me, and he's been raised well. He's, he's polite. I'll call him William. And William was sitting there next to me, and, and he said, so do you live in Washington, D.C.? And I thought, that sounds like my line, you know? And I said, no, no, and I'm up here uh, going to a, a conference. And uh, I said, uh, where, uh, he said, where do you live? And I said, I live in South Carolina. He said, oh, I live in North Carolina. And uh, I said, what, what's bringing you to Washington? He told me all about the Job Corps and how he's going to get a job. And I thought, you know, if you find a young person who's right out of high school who will sit down next to a grown man 
and start up a polite conversation, somebody's raised him right, <laughs> okay? And so we had a good talk. And before long, we were able to start talking about the Lord. And he showed a genuine interest. And so we talked for about an hour. And then we, we hadn't gotten to the place where I would invite him to pray with me yet, but uh, he wanted to continue to talk. And so we deplaned, and, and as we were gathered up our stuff and going down the jetway and going to the concourse, um, he, he, he obviously didn't know where to go or what to do. I said, you familiar with this airport? And he said, no. Uh, that airplane I just got off of was the first time I've ever flown on a plane. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, well, come here. I'll show you what to do. And he said, where, where do I get my suitcase? I said, come on, that's where I'm going. And so we just continued our conversation. We walked down the concourse, and uh, we got there, and uh, wouldn't you know it, uh, my bag didn't show. And uh, so we're waiting, and he's waiting for his ride, and his ride didn't show. So we stood around for a while, and I found some fellow. He came running up and had my bag. And so now uh, I said, what are you going to do if your ride doesn't come? I don't know, he said. Uh, they're supposed to, they said they'd be in, a, in a, red, a red van, but I haven't seen a red van. I said, somebody from the Job Corps is supposed to come and get you? Yeah. And I said, where is the Job Corps? He said, I don't know. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, you know, somebody left this young man in the lurch. I guess what happened was the Lord left him in my care. My nephew, two, both my nephews are Air Force officers, and one of them was stationed not far from Washington, D.C. at the time, and he was picking me up. And so I was standing there waiting, talking to this young man to see what was going to happen. And uh, both my nephews are solid Christians. And uh, so I heard his voice from across the, he's a big, tall kid. And, and, and uh, I said, no, I'm a kid, he's a colonel. <laughs> but at any rate, he, uh, he was standing by his red pickup truck over there. And he says, Uncle John. And I turned and I waved to him. And so he pulled up. And I said, this is my friend. And I gave him his name. I said, he's going over to the job, the job Corps, and uh, his ride didn't show up today. And I've been talking to him about the Lord, and I sure would like to have a little bit more of a conversation with him. He said, well, let's take him to Job Corps. And so we loaded him up in the truck, put his suitcase in the back, and I, I kept talking. And all the way over there, and the Job Corps was not that close. It was on the other side of the Potomac. And so we had to go up and get a, get a bridge and go over there. And the whole way... I'm turned around and I'm talking to him. He's in the back seat. And I'm telling him about Jesus. And my nephew, whom I really had looked forward to this time with him, he's over there praying. I know he's praying. And he's nodding and, and we're going. And so finally, we're not too far away from Job Corps. And this young man is understanding he's got a responsibility. And he needs to do, needs to do something about what he's heard. And he starts talking things like this. You know, I thought I was coming up here to learn how to be an electrician. But I think what I'm learning now is more important. And, I, and so I invited him. Before we were finished, I invited him to pray and receive Christ as his Savior. And he did it. Sit in the back seat of my nephew's truck. He received the Lord Jesus. We pulled up the job corps, and my nephew said to him, We well, I don't live far from here. You got a place to go to church? He said, I've never thought about going to church. He said, how about if I come by and pick you up Sunday morning? He said, that'd be wonderful. Now, the Lord sewed that one up real quick. I mean, he trusted the Lord. He prayed. He made a commitment to go to church. It was exciting. It really was. And sometimes you'll get ones like that. You really will. We said goodbye to him, and we prayed, and we headed all the way back around the Potomac to go back uh, to where we were going in the first place. My nephew made a comment to me. He said, Uncle John, you evangelize like you're going into combat. <laughs> I said, well, you got to be ready. <laughs> you got to have your gun loaded, <laughs> and you got to know where you're going. And I said, I take that as a compliment. He's a dear, dear, fine young man. He, he'll go into ministry when, he's, when he gets out of the Air Force. I'm convinced of it. Now, that witnessing opportunity was a wonderful conversation. It was a wonderful time to talk to him. And I felt real comfortable about it because I was older, had more experience, I knew what I was doing, and I talked to this young man, and he sweetly trusted me. But not every conversation is like that. Nor are they like that fellow who was sleeping, 
who had that medallion around his neck that we talked about earlier. I'll tell you about one more fellow. Coming back from Puerto Rico, been down there for a conference, and this gentleman is sitting next to me, and he clearly is a very sophisticated, highly educated, articulate individual. Brilliant, brilliant man. He was an astrophysicist, which is something I'm not. <laughs> and so he was, I mean, he, and, and he, I was talking with him, and, and we, we were having this conversation, and I listened to him, and I asked him what he did, and he told me all about it. And, and I said, can I ask you some questions? And he said, sure. So I asked him about you know, things I was curious about. I wanted to know what a binary star was. I wanted to know what, what a black hole was. And he, he was able to teach me all these things he knew and understood. I did not know when I first met Carol that her father is, is, is he an astrophysicist? He's a physicist and a great mathematician who worked for NASA for decades. Brilliant. And so here I'm talking to this fellow and He's, he's teaching me all these things about this, this subject matter, which is simple to him. And so we started talking about, about Christianity. So he, he asked me, what, what do you do? And I, I said, well, I'm a preacher. And, uh, and he said, well, you seem like a, a fairly well-read person. Would you, would you be one of those preachers that believes in what we call a young earth? And I said, I would be. And then he said to me, you seem like a reasonable person. <laughs> How can you hold that view, being a reasonable person? And so I said, it's not a question of science. That's your department. It's a question of theology. You know, death is the result of sin. And if you have all these eons of evolution, then you have repeated death before sin is ever introduced. And therefore, you're making a disconnect between sin and death. And the whole story of Christianity is the story of bringing the dead back to life, giving them spiritual life. And we talked about those kinds of things, and he had some wonderful questions, and he was extremely respectful. And we had talked about all these brilliant things that we were talking, that, that, that I was trying to just glean from him. And, and he taught me for an, over an hour about his field of study and the brilliant things that he knew. I had no idea who this man was at the time. And finally, we got down to the thing. I said, let me ask you a question while we've got just a few more minutes. I said, are you, are you remotely curious about what was happening, what was going on, five seconds before the Big Bang? And he kind of smiled, and he said, well, that's your department. <laughs> he said it like that. And I thought, well, thank you, sir. Yes, it is. That, that is my department. Everything you've talked to me about is the result of the Big Bang. But I've been talking to you about before the Big Bang and who, and who pulled the trigger, <laughs> okay? Whatever happened, I talked to you about the Lord. He was respectful. He was kind. He was thoughtful. He was gracious. He was absolutely brilliant. And, I, you know, I'm going to give his name, I think. I don't think I put his name in the book. It was Jervant Trezian, a renowned astrophysicist who was in charge of that big radio telescope that was down there in Arecibo, uh, Puerto Rico. It's in disrepair now, and they're going to decommission it. Chairman of the Department of Astronomy at Cornell. That's who the Lord put me beside on the plane that day. Now, I've got to tell you, even as an experienced witness and an experienced pastor, if I had known who he was, I might have been a little bit timid to try to hold a conversation with this fellow. But we had a wonderful time, a wonderful conversation, did a little research. I didn't know who he was until I started talking to Carol about this story. She, being the researcher that she is, found him in a heartbeat and got his name and where he was from. We heard recordings. Brilliant, brilliant man. Wrote the foreword to, what's that guy's? Carl Sagan. Wrote the foreword to Carl Sagan's book on the cosmos and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, if I had known that's who I was sitting beside, I might have been a little bit timid. But I didn't think about who he was. I thought about who Jesus was. 
And so I was able to have a conversation with this man. I'd love to be able to tell you that he got saved as a result of it. I don't know that fact. I do know that I gave him the gospel very clearly, and he was very respectful while I did so. I have to leave the rest of it with the Lord. And that's the whole point of what I'm trying to say to you today. Be faithful in the opportunities that God gives you. Use your conversation. Let your conversation be your testimony and, and your message. And I was going to go over here and refer to that verse uh, that I read in the Sunday school hour, but for the sake of those of you who weren't in the Sunday school hour, I'll read it and then we'll close. I'll read verse 10 as well. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. God's given you the opportunity to speak for Jesus. You speak as the very word of God. When a man stands in the pulpit and preaches about the Bible or preaches about the word of God, we do not hesitate to say he preached the word of God. It's kind of presumptuous to say that a man would get up and use his own words and then say he was preaching the word of God. Listen, if your words are consistent with the message of this book and your life backs up what those words say, you can say you're, you're speaking the word of God without hesitation. When you speak, if you use your speaking gift to tell others about Jesus, you do that as of the oracles of God. That word appears two other times in the New Testament, and both times it's speaking of the literal word of God. In Romans, Moses went up on the mount to receive the lively oracles, the word, the words from God. And if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. God knows you. He knows what your gifts are. He knows what your abilities are. He knows how you can talk to people. Just, just represent the Lord. Don't be hesitant to represent Him. Now, there may be some of you in here, you're accomplished witnesses for Christ. You love to talk to people about Jesus. You love to lead people to Christ. You love to bring them to church and disciple them and carry them along. You love it, and you do it frequently. Good for you. But there might be some others of you here, you're a little timid. You say, well, I, that's not my gift. You talk sometimes to some people, don't you? You ever have a conversation with a stranger? You know what a lot of strangers do when they first meet? Complain about whatever they're waiting on. That's what a lot of people do. Go to see a doctor and pay him a whole lot of money and sit in his waiting room and complain about the fact that you're waiting. Be the one that will speak for the Lord. Amen. Simple, simple truth. Simple message. I don't know if you'll remember anything I've said this morning, but remember this. You can do this. You can have a gospel conversation. You can talk to other people about the Lord. And if you can give them the gospel, give them a gospel tract, get them to church or something. Story in here about a man. He was a very faithful witness. He just couldn't get people to pray. He was too timid to ask them to pray to receive the Lord. So he'd get them right on the verge where they were about to pray, and then he'd call me and say, i got a friend that, that, that can I bring him over? And I knew exactly what he was doing. Came over to my house in the, like the middle of the night one time. It was after midnight. Brought this young lady over to my house. She was on the verge. He led her to the Lord. I helped her pray. And then he married her. Not that night. Not that night, but later, eventually. Why don't you just tell the Lord today, I used to do this more than I'm doing it now. I'd like to get back to it. Lord, if you'll help me, if you'll send somebody my way, I'll try to be faithful. Now you can say, well, you know, why don't y'all come, come visit our church sometime? That's fine. Do that. You'll be amazed. If you're ready to talk, if you're ready to tell folks about Jesus, you'll have people walk up and ask you. You really will. They'll start the conversation if, if the Lord knows he can count on you to finish it. <laughs> so I encourage you, have some gospel conversations. Father, thank you for these dear folks.